Good morning. My name is Patty Lofgren. Please open your Bibles to Romans 12, 1 and 2, and follow along with me as I read. It's page number 1761 in the Blue Bible. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Well, good morning. Good to be together here on the first Sunday of the new year. Good to be worshiping together and uh, kind of exciting, actually, to be jumping back into the book of Romans. I want to say uh, say a special good morning to those in the Connection Cafe and those watching on live stream. Um, All of us, one church all over the place, and that's okay. Well, today we're going to jump back in to Romans. And uh, if you remember back in November, if you were here for that or remember that, Um, We wrapped up Romans 11 with this wonderful gospel doxology. Paul just poured forth these words of praise after 11 chapters of digging into the gospel and explaining all this good news. He then wrapped up, and it almost felt in a sense like, oh, he's he's ending his letter. But the fact is, that was was not the end at all. This crescendo um, was not his ultimate conclusion. He still has five more chapters that he is going to write in this letter, and uh, we're excited to dig into those. Romans 12 through 16 is this focus on practical Christian living, and we're going to enjoy that for a couple of months here, the gospel, a gospel for everyday living. Important to recognize, uh, Paul is still teaching us about the gospel In fact, he's warmed up now, and he's ready to go and really dig in even more deeply. He laid out this theological framework about the gospel in the first 11 chapters, and now he's going to flesh it out for us with practical examples of how this gospel good news should be lived out on a daily basis. We worship God with our lives in grateful response to his gospel mercy toward us. Look how Paul begins here in verse 1. Therefore, in other words, therefore, in light of the first 11 chapters, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to dot, dot, dot. And the next five chapters will be that ellipsis. They will fill in what he's urging us to do. Paul actually highlighted God's mercy right toward the end of chapter 11, right before his gospel doxology in Romans 11, 32, He said, for God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. So mercy was a key point here for for his heart and his mind, his response of worship. All of us have inherited Adam's sin nature. All of us have sinned. We've gone astray through decisions we've made. And in God's perfect foreknowledge, God saw what was coming, and he prepared for our redemption through the events of Christmas and Easter. And so here we are right on the tail end of the Christmas season, and yet we're headed in the next couple months toward Easter. And these are key events in human history that display God's mercy and reveal his plan for humankind. Through Jesus' birth and his life and his death and resurrection, each one of us has an opportunity to be reunited with our God, to be made right with him because his mercy was poured out in this way. So throughout this exploration we have now, the next five chapters of Romans, verse 1 urges us, keep God's mercy in view. Keep in mind all that we've learned about the gospel as we now look at these next five chapters in view of God's merciful salvation. How then should we live? How should we continue in this process of becoming deeply devoted followers of Jesus together? And we'll answer that question as we go into these next chapters. But before we go any further today, would you pray with me? 
Well, Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your word. We're thankful for the book of Romans today. And we ask that by your spirit, you would guide us into your truth. Help us to grasp the meaning of the gospel and the implications of the gospel. And then to live that out by your power and for your glory. So please help us now in Jesus' name. Amen. We also worship God with our lives through the reverent obedience of holy living. Romans 12, 1 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. This word offer is one of the first clues here that Paul is talking about worship. Offer as in offering We just prayed for the offering. Pastor Eric led us in prayer for the offering. But offering is far more than our tithes and offerings. It's offering our whole lives in worship. When we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, we're offering our entire lives as an act of worship that is holy. It's pleasing to our Lord. We actually talked about offering every part of our lives in worship. Back in Romans 6, maybe some of you were here, remember Romans 6, 13? Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to Him as an instrument of righteousness. It's the same idea here in Romans 6. See, Romans 12 isn't the first time that Paul has connected the gospel to Christian living. It really has all been mixed together all along. He's been talking about Christian living actually quite a bit, not quite as prominently, but it's been there the whole time, implicitly and sometimes explicitly. I really appreciate a footnote I found in my study Bible this week. It says this, chapters 12 through 16 are not a postscript to the great theological discussions in chapters 1 through 11. In a real sense, the entire letter has been directed toward the goal of showing that God demands our action as well as our believing and thinking. Faith expresses itself through obedience. This is so well written, so well stated. Obedience pleases the Lord. One of the ways we worship Him is through our obedience. Now, some of your Bible translations in verse 1, you might notice that they translate it holy and acceptable rather than holy and pleasing. Even though it looks like those are kind of two different words, two different translations, they're actually very similar to each other. They're, They're closely related to each other. And the fact is, the Greek word here that's used can mean both, pleasing and acceptable. The, the struggle here is we don't actually have a particular English word that directly translates the full meaning of what the Greek is trying to say here, so each translation is trying to express this idea. What Paul's driving at here is that, that God is pleased when our behavior is acceptable. It's all one idea. God is pleased when our behavior is acceptable to Him. So to put it another way, acceptable behavior is one of the primary ways that we worship God because He is pleased by that. Holy living is how we worship God with our lives. Now, as we mentioned a couple of months ago, Paul actually talks about this idea of obedience at the very beginning and the very end of his letter and then the whole way through. So if we back up all the way to Romans 1, verse 5, it begins, through him, through Jesus, we received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And then at the end of the letter, we're not there yet, but when we get to 16, verse 26, we'll see that it concludes so that all the Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith. It's all tied in. Our faith is tied in with an obedience, and our obedience is an act of worship to the Lord. It's a response to His great mercy in our lives. There's a Bible commentator named Andrew David Nacelli, and I appreciate how he says this. The gospel 
is theological and practical. As the phrase, the obedience that comes from faith, suggests, the gospel transforms how we live. Genuine faith in Jesus Christ results in genuine obedience to Him. Christian life is not just a facade. It's not just putting on airs. It's, it's not just a pretend holiness. There is a genuineness to it. The Christian life is a Spirit-empowered life. It's a God-honoring life. It's a Jesus-reflecting life of obedience. That's what the Christian faith is. The message paraphrase captures some of this in verse 1. Take your everyday, ordinary life your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Christian life, Spirit-empowered, God-honoring, Jesus-reflecting life of obedience. Friends, worshiping God means so much more than showing up here on Sunday morning or watching on live stream on Sunday morning. That's part of it. Part of our worship is gathering on Sunday. Scripture encourages us not to forsake the assembling together. It's important that we worship like this. But worship is way beyond one day a week or one hour or two a week. Worship is 24-7. Every second of every minute, of every hour, of every day, throughout the year 2024 and beyond. On into eternity, we will be worshiping the Lord with our lives. And that is the joy and the celebration and the honor that we have in knowing the Lord. So let me be real practical here. We worship the Lord whether we're skiing or ice fishing, whether we're knitting or crocheting or playing pickleball whether we're at school or we're at work, whatever we're doing, wherever we are, we're worshiping Him, we're honoring Him with our lives in every moment. In all that we do, worshiping God with our lives. (coughs) Excuse me. Now, the reason that we worship God with our lives is because it's the only appropriate response to what He's done for us to all that He's done for us. Again, Romans 12, 1 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Now, when I come to the end of verse 1, I'll be frank with you, when I see true, that kind of resonates with me, my true worship. That makes sense. But when I see proper, at first it sort of throws me off. Think of the word proper. Our worship needs to be proper, <clears throat> like it needs to be something formal. You need to pray the proper way, read Scripture the proper way, worship God the proper way. And that's not quite what this word is really getting at. It, it's, it's a way to say that our worship should be appropriate, given the goodness and the kindness of God's mercy. It's very reasonable proper and reasonable for us to respond with worship, worshiping Him with our lives. That's proper. The New King James Version captures the idea pretty well. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. That's a good way of saying what what proper means. Reasonable service, it's the rational or logical response to all God has done by His mercy. In fact, worship is the only logical response to God's mercy. And that's why this follows right on the heels of Romans 11 where we had this beautiful gospel doxology of worship and it flows right into 12 where the worship continues with our lives. There's a connection there. It's entirely proper for us as human beings to respond to God's mercy by worshiping Him with our very lives. And the way we worship God with our lives is by discerning and doing God's will each day. Verse 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Let's talk here first about discerning, then we'll talk about the doing of God's will. Best way to discern God's will is to renew our minds each day. This constant renewal. In fact, each and every one of us needs to renew our minds each and every day because each and every day the world is going to pressure us another direction. It's going to push us and nudge us and squeeze us to conform to its pattern rather than to God's pattern. The pattern of this world is referring to the world's overall brokenness and sin condition. We're living in this present evil age. That's where all of us live. That's why Romans 12, 2 is warning us clearly, do not conform to the pattern of the world in which you live. However, most of us have figured out by now that that's easier said than done. Pressure is on, it seems, all the time. When we think of being conformed to the pattern of this world, we can picture being squeezed into a mold. If you remember making Christmas cutout cookies, maybe you had the, the, the dough there, and then you had to roll it out flat, and then you had to cut it into shapes, molding, forming, shaping, or if you've ever played with Play-Doh, um, I know I still like playing with Play-Doh and full, forming it and making it. It takes some pressure, it takes some, some uh, finesse there to really make it into the shape you want. And that's what this world wants to do with us. It wants to make us look and feel and behave according to its standards, according to its wisdom, rather than God's standards and God's wisdom. 1 Peter 1.14 warns us, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. And just in case there might be anyone gathered here today or watching online and we feel that we have now grown so mature and so deeply spiritual that the world could never conform us, lest we fall for that lie to ourselves, let's remember 1 Corinthians 10, 12. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Even if we've walked with the Lord for a lifetime, even if it's been decades of His transformative power in our lives, we need to be careful. We need to consider that pressure to conform. Whether a brand new Christian or walking with Him a long time, we would do well to heed this warning. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. All too easy. For one of us to fall into these worldly patterns, because that's where we live, day in and day out, and tell heaven, this is the world in which we live. And there are many good and wonderful things to be celebrated in this world, but there is also a world system and a pattern that's trying to take control of us. And far too often, deeply devoted followers of Jesus can become like the frog in the pot. Some of you know that illustration. Frog there, sitting in the pot, having a nice little swim, doing a little backstroke, whatever. The temperature's slowly getting hotter, and because he's a reptile, now none of us are reptiles, to be clear, but because he's a reptile, he doesn't notice that so much. Temperature's getting hotter and hotter. There's a real danger coming. And much like that frog, we become accustomed to the sin that's all around us. It becomes part of our normal environment. We begin to listen to the ungodly counsel. Gradually, it begins to impact us. Our modern-day culture begins to creep in, and we acclimate. And slowly, it doesn't usually happen quickly, but slowly, we lower our guard. And that's how it seeps in. This world we live in, the internet included, this online world is out there as well. It becomes our normal environment. If we don't take care to renew our minds on a regular basis, we are in jeopardy. It's no wonder why the pattern of this world starts to match up with the pattern of our lives. And our lives take on a sinful pattern. 
without even realizing it, we end up in patterns of sexually immoral behavior. Patterns of pursuing worldly wealth and possessions rather than pursuing God. Patterns of finding our identity in what the world thinks of us rather than what our Heavenly Father thinks of us. And on and on, these sinful patterns creep in, press in. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24 reminds us, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Well, God's Word not only warns us against the danger of being conformed to the world's pattern, but it also encourages us. God's Word encourages us to be transformed in the right direction. Verse 2 declares, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now, God helps us with this transformation in two stages. The first one is our salvation. Our transformation begins on the day of our salvation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. There's this amazing initial transformation that happens on the day of our salvation. So there's no point in trying to be holy if we are not yet saved from our sin. If we've not yet been transformed, holiness is impossible for us. But when on the day of our salvation we're newly created, the Holy Spirit begins to dwell within us, and we're transformed by the incredible power of the gospel. But the transformation doesn't stop there. The next stage of our transformation happens gradually and over time, continues through our daily sanctification. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So in Romans 12, 2 talks here about be transformed. It might at first sound like it's a one and done. Be transformed, done. The work's over. It's all finished. But that's not really what's happening here. That's not how it works. It's actually referring to this ongoing, continuing process of renewal. It happens over time. We might even say it this way, which wouldn't be great English, but we could say, be being transformed. Be being transformed. That's why we use the word becoming when we talk about becoming deeply devoted followers of Jesus. It doesn't happen overnight. It's a process. God's Spirit at work within us, making us holy. Now, Romans 12, 2 doesn't spell out exactly how to renew our minds. It just emphasizes it's important that we do this. It warns us that if we aren't undergoing this transformative renewal of our minds, then we'll be trapped in this pressure cooker of conforming to the world's pattern. Fortunately, though, there are other parts in Scripture that do encourage us how to renew our minds, strategies for how to renew our minds. Psalm 119 is a good example. Verses 9 through 16. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips, I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes. As one rejoices in great riches, I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. And that last phrase kind of grabs your attention, doesn't it? I will not neglect your word. Psalm 119 is such good advice for young people who want to have their lives transformed by the renewing of their minds. And it's good advice for those of us who are a little older as well. 
That's why we are selling Bibles out in the Connection Cafe. We want everyone to have a good copy of God's Word that's easy to read and easy to understand, that has some helpful study notes in it as we try to grow in our faith. That's why we're recommending Bible reading plans. If you've never read through the entire Bible, consider doing that in the next year or two or three. Get a reading plan and take your time and read through God's Word start to finish. And if you have done that before, still a great idea to do it again. There's a lot in there. It's hard to catch everything on the first read. But those Bible reading plans are there encouraging us to dig into God's Word so that God's Word can inform us and renew our minds. Pastor Eric led a great class this morning during the Sunday school hour on resolving to read the Bible. And if you missed that and are interested in that information, I know he would love an email or a phone call or someone to buy him a cup of coffee, and uh, he can run you right through the information, but very helpful stuff. We want to be encouraging one another as a church to be in God's Word, to let it renew our minds, teach us what God's will is. Another strategy for renewing our minds is found in 2 Corinthians 10.5. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. That's why this last December over the Advent season, we took a more apologetics approach in the sermons. That's why we recommended so highly this book, Is Christmas Unbelievable? by Rebecca McLaughlin. We want to be thinking about the questions that we can ask about the faith and about the reliability of the Scriptures. We need to renew our minds with what's true, not allow arguments and pretenses from the world to discourage us in any way or lead us astray, not let the world conform us to its ideas, but receive those questions with good answers so we understand what's really true. So in 2024, let's resolve together personally and as a church to make sure we set aside time for reading and studying God's Word. Above anything else we read, anything else we study, to study God's Word, to renew our minds with a right understanding so we know what's true and what's false, what we can rely on and trust in, and what we need to be aware of. Let's make sure that our kids and our grandkids get to Sunday school and get to Wednesday night ministry, kids club, and youth group. And let's make sure that we as adults get to Sunday school or a Bible study and be part of a life group, that we're finding time to sharpen one another and encourage one another and feed on God's Word together more than one hour a week to go deeper, to dig in. Make sure we're renewing our minds with God's Word. Romans 12, 2 ends by referring to God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. And just so we're clear, when we say good, pleasing, and perfect here, we're saying that according to God's standards, not our standards. Not what we would necessarily define as good, pleasing, and perfect, but what what God would define that as consistently being transformed by renewing our minds enables us to rightly discern God's perfect will. As opposed to our own will, as opposed to the will of the world around us, that's why we pray. In fact, in a few minutes, we will pray these words together in the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We desire to know His will and do His will, and see it accomplished on this earth. If we're not continually renewing our minds, then we're putting ourselves at great risk of drifting away from God's goodness and what pleases Him and what is in His perfect will for us. Renewing our minds with God's perfect will not only protects us from errors in our theology, but it protects us from errors in our theopraxy, errors in how we live out our faith. Well, now we've considered some ways that we can renew our mind, discern God's will. Let's talk about what it means to do God's will each day. 
The rest of Romans 12 and the chapters that follow are going to lay out some very practical specifics. We'll jump in right away next week, and we'll just kind of be on our way for the next few months looking at very practical ways of what what it means to do God's will and live out His will. But how? How do we do that? How will we accomplish those things? How do we live out holy lives of reverent obedience? Sounds right. It sounds good. It's attractive, but challenging. Well, the answer is hinted at in the word holy. We cannot be holy on our own, which is why God gives us His Holy Spirit. That's why we have the gift of the Holy Spirit when we put our faith in God. By His Spirit living within each and every believer, God helps us to accomplish His good, pleasing, and perfect will. He helps us succeed in that. He provides what we need. So once we've rightly discerned God's will, the best way to do it is to depend on the Spirit's empowerment, which sounds kind of spiritual because it is. It's exactly what it is. It is a spiritual thing to depend on, the, on God, on His Spirit working within us. We talked about the Spirit's empowerment back in Romans 8, 26 and 27. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. We need the Spirit in order to be holy, in order to live reverent lives. As Jesus was preparing himself to go to the cross, which we're going to commemorate in just a few minutes here with our communion service, but as he was preparing himself to go to the cross, he was also preparing his followers for a time when they would be living their lives without him physically present. They were used to him physically being there, but he was about to leave. And Jesus knew that. And so he prepared them in John 14, 15 through 17. He tells his followers, If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you, be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. See, Jesus said this shortly before Pentecost when the Holy Spirit would be sent on the early church and the same Spirit that indwelt them is the Spirit who indwells anyone who is a believer in Jesus Christ. Dear friends, let us not forget our advocate, the Holy Spirit. And let us not underestimate the Spirit's power in our lives. Because that is how we do God's will. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for you. And as we begin the year 2024, we want to begin by examining how we can become better worshipers. Lord, we pray that our lives will overflow with a grateful response to your gospel mercy toward us. Please help us to live holy lives of reverent obedience. We worship you, Lord, for who you are, for all you've done for us. We give you glory. We give you praise. By your Holy Spirit, we would ask, we request, we plead with you, Lord, that you would please enable us to rightly discern your will and then empower us to do it. Empower us to live out the Christian life that you've prepared for us. May we do that each and every day. We ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen.